Hello and welcome to this Meet Your Future session. In these sessions, we hear from people in different roles and you have the opportunity to ask them your questions about what they do and how they got to where they are. My name is Jamie Sloan and I'm your host today. I work at the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and it is my job to help young people find out more about the different careers and options that are out there. One of the ways that you can do that is on the GMAX website, gmacs.co.uk, which has lots of information for young people who live in Greater Manchester. Today, though, we're going to hear from Alison Bruff at Wilmot Dixon and Richard Smith at ISG, and they are going to be talking about green skills in the construction industry, a very important and relevant topic. So if you've got any questions, please do put them in the chat and we will have time to answer some of them at the end. I am now delighted to hand over to Alison and Richard. OK. Thank you very much. Great. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for having us. Um, so my name's Rich Smith. I'm a sustainability and social value manager working for ISG um, in our Construction North region. And ISG are kind of like a, a main building contractor. So that means we, we build and renovate buildings. And I've been working in the sustainability sector for eight to nine years now. Um, Alison. Good morning. My name is Alison Bruff. I'm a principal environmental manager for Wilmot Dixon. And similar to Richard, I cover the northern region. We are also a principal contractor and build a lot of leisure centres, schools and police stations across the north of England and North Wales. I've been working with Wilmot Dixon now for seven and a half years and previously was an environmental consultant. Great, thanks Alison. So, so this morning we're going to talk to you about um, environmental and sustainability careers in construction or it's often called the, the built environment. So deciding what you want to do in the future can be a really hard decision to make. I definitely didn't know what I wanted to do when I was at school and even when I left university. So today's session is really just to kind of give you a flavour of what the environment and sustainability is, why it's important and the sorts of roles that are available in construction. Um, just to kind of reiterate what Jamie had said, if you've got any questions, whack them in the chat. There are no silly questions um, and if we don't get around to them all, I'm sure we can take them away and get back to you via GMAX um, at a later date. Cool, next slide, Jamie. So what is the environment and sustainability? Next slide again. So the environment refers to all living and non-living elements which make up the world's various ecosystems. So that's us right now. It's the classrooms, houses you're sitting in, and it's what's outside your window. It includes water, air, land, flora, so flowers, fauna, all the animals and organisms kind of that go with it and all the natural resources as well. So that could be wood, it could be stone, it could be metals. It could be the things like fossil fuels that are, um, are kind of so prevalent at the moment. So coal, oil and gas. Um, next slide, please, Jamie. So why is the environment important? Well, we live in it. Um, it provides living organisms like us with all the resources that we need in order to live our lives and thrive. Everything that we eat, wear, use, and the places that we live, um, and the places that we live in all constitutes our environment. And really importantly, the natural environment or nature is in balance. Nothing takes too much. Natural processes are kind of cyclical, so they're, they're renewable. They constantly replenish. But then humans came along and we've been really successful at using the environment to our advantage, using its ecosystems and resources probably for over 200,000 years now. And this is all fine. We had small populations, but humanity really boomed in the 1800s, so 320 years ago, during a process called industrialization. And we have steadily used more and more resources in the environment since that time, and our populations have increased with our technolo technological advancements, achievements and success. Uh, next slide, please, Jimmy. So people realised the importance of our planet, our environment, when humans first landed on the moon in, on the 21st of July in 1969. And Neil Armstrong would have looked across the moon's grey surface and he would have seen an image very similar to the one that you see now. And in fact, those astronauts did take a picture and they beamed it back and soon everyone got a glimpse of the planet that we live on. It's a small blue and green oasis. It's our lifeboat floating in the cold infinity of the universe. And people started to realise that our environment, our planet Earth, is fragile. We only have one and we've got to protect it. Uh, next slide, Jamie. 
So if we fast forward to the present day, 2022, and, we, and we're starting to see the results of humanity's growth and success, we're seeing unusual and unseasonal fluctuations in temperatures, resulting in flooding, drought, wildflowers, uh, the melting of the ice caps, and we've got a few kind of neat little pictures in there. Our climate, our environment is now changing faster than nature, and that includes us, can adapt. So as a result of that, in 2019, the European Union finally declared a climate emergency. And in all about 34 countries and many, many more local authorities and cities have done so. Uh, next slide, Jimmy. And if you just kind of click, click for me. Yeah, there we go. So this is just a really nice recap of what the environment is. So it's basically everything needed to support life. So it's our air, water, the organisms, the flora and fauna that sit within it, all of the raw materials, so our farming, cotton, our timber. But then it's also what we're producing, so all of the waste. And then it's it's the, those environments that kind of support us and nourish us. So all about our health and well-being. You know that that feeling of when you go into a forest and, and you get restored through the green space and things like that. So it's, it's everything that's in and 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 surrounds us. Uh, on again, Jamie. So sustainability. So with the growth of the environmental movement um, roughly following the moon landings and our realisation that the environment can support human growth um, infinitely, the concept of sustainability was born. And sustainability means meeting the needs of the present, so today, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this is really important. It's all about living our lives in a way that does not detract from future generations to come. Uh, next slide, Jenny. So what makes up sustainability? Well, it consists of three pillars or three parts that together make a whole. So we've got the environment. So that's our environment. It's Earth's natural pro, um, resources and it's, it's everything that we've kind of previously discussed. It's economic. So that's our businesses, our industries and our economies. And it's social. So it's the human part. It's, it's us. It's what we need to interact and be healthy. Sometimes this is known as the three P's, so people, planet and profit. Uh, and if you're dead fancy, it's also known as the triple bottom line. Next slide, please, Jamie. So how has the world responded to the need for sustainability and the climate crisis? Well, the United Nations developed the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs in 2015. And if you look at businesses kind of ac across all the different sectors, not just construction, they will often refer back to these. There are 17 and they're a call of action um, to all countries. They recognise that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. I think it's, it's important to understand that what this is saying is it's linking everything together. You can't tackle climate change if you still have an issue with poverty and inequality. We've got to address all of hum humanity's issues together if we're going to overcome this, this giant challenge. Um, slide 12. And really, this is just a reminder. We've had a pretty crazy last few years with COVID and the impacts of the pandemic, which we're going to likely feel in the next few years or tens of years to come. But it's really important not to lose sight of climate change, and it will be our task collectively to do something about it, whether that's in our personal lives or in our careers. Next, Jamie. Okay, Alison. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, taking into account everything that Richard has said, we're now going to look at how specifically the construction industry has an impact on the environment. Next slide, please, Jimmy. So, from a global perspective, the construction industry has a large part to play in combating global issues. Like many other industries, the construction industry is making a contribution towards climate change. So due to the nature of what we do in terms of the operations that take place on site, so we're using large heavy plant machinery, big diggers and excavators and cranes that all use fossil fuels and therefore release greenhouse gases into the environment. 
The other aspect of that is not just the, the carbon that we release from our operations, but also the carbon associated with the materials that, that we use. So there is carbon and energy used to make the bricks, the blocks, the plasterboard and the steel that we construct our buildings with. And the construction industry is working together to try and reduce the amount of carbon, both from our operational aspects, but also in the materials that we are using. Species loss. So as Richard touched on, when we look at the flora and fauna and inevitably when we start on a site and take on a new site, be that a site that's been previously developed or a farmer's field, a greenfield site, we are going to disrupt, disturb and damage the habitat that's already existing there, which ultimately may lead to species loss. But again, as an industry, we are really concerned about this and are taking steps to ensure that when we leave a site, we leave it in a better place than it was when we arrived. So we will look to provide species enhancement, uh, biodiversity enhancement, looking at, at the, the habitats, um, the plants and animals that were living there before and either restore those habitats, replace them or, as I say, enhance them. In relation to global deforestation, um, we use a number of different natural materials as part of the construction process and it's really important to us as an industry that we understand where those materials are coming from and make sure that we source them responsibly and from sustainable sources. And finally, linking back to, to the, Richard's last slide, we are working as an industry to help meet the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And that includes us making a commitment to ensure that any cities and communities that we're involved in, that we're providing sustainable buildings and protecting the life on the land, as well as anything in the water around us. Next slide, please, Jamie. So some, some quite scary statistics for you, but the construction industry produces approximately 100 million tonnes of waste in the UK each year. And that's over a third of the country's total waste production. I had a look at the 2018 government statistics on waste, and in the UK, the government in, in the UK, we produced 222 million tonnes of waste in 2018. That's the latest year the data I could get available for. And of that, 62% came from the construction industry, but that also included our excavation waste. And then there was 58 million tonnes of soil produced in 20, 2018. Globally, the construction sector is also responsible for approximately 11% of the planet's total carbon emissions. And as I touched on um, earlier, a lot of that comes from the materials that we are using in terms of developing and creating the, the buildings. Next slide, please, Jamie. This is a really interesting little graph to show you. So the black line shows the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. And as you can see, that from about the 1950s onwards, this line takes a sharp rise in gradient and the concentration has significantly increased since this time. The red and blue bars show the Earth's global temperature. So as you can see, up until about 1940, the temperatures were primarily blue, so that below that global average. There was a slight increase, you can see between 1939 and 1945, the dates you may well be familiar with, but during World War II, the Earth's temperature rose due to the increase in the amount of gases and things from all the ammunition and explosions and um, war efforts going on and then as you can see since 1970 there's been a rapid increase in the global temperature. Next slide please Jamie. So as, as we've touched on the construction industry has, ha has a large impact on the environment and we've looked at how that impact is on the global issues but also that can happen at a local level. And as an environmental manager, it's my responsibility to make sure that any projects that we are involved in, we minimise and reduce or eliminate as much as we can the impact that we have on environment. Some of the examples of what we will look at will be how we can prevent pollution of air or watercourses. So often we are working in um, 
urban environments, and what we don't want to do is increase any air pollution within that environment. We are also very aware of the impact that we could have on local water courses. So that could be from activities carried out on site. So it could be um, silty water. We're also using fuels and oils on site, and it is imperative that we do not allow any of that to get into the local water courses. And as I said, we're also at great risk of causing a loss of biodiversity site on site. So that would be because when we arrive on a site, we often have to clear it to make space for us to construct our buildings. Um, we also produce a lot of waste, unfortunately. So we're currently a lot of work's going on within the industry to understand and work on reducing the amount of waste we produce. In terms of reducing our carbon emissions, there have been great advances in recent years in relation to the use of electric plant on site um, and also looking at the types of fuels that we use to reduce the amount of carbon emissions from our projects. There are a number of activities that take place on our sites that involve the use of water. So this may include the, the production of mortar to be able to allow us to um, put the bricks and blocks together. But there's also a lot of water used in terms of plaster on site. So again, with changes in technology and changes in processes, we are reducing the amount of water we use on site. The final bullet point there in relation to our impact um, relates to resource depletion. So as I said, um, as an industry, we are acutely aware of the impact that we have on the use of natural resources. And again, through changes in technology and the use of recycled materials, we are trying to reduce our impact in terms of the amount of resources we use. Along with all that negative um, impacts, there are also a lot of positive benefits that we as an industry are um, working towards. In terms of so going forward, what we are looking to provide is warmer and more efficient buildings. There is a big industry drive to ensure that build, buildings produced now are sustainable and will be able to meet the needs of future generations in terms of changes in um, future climate scenarios. So be that wetter weather or warmer weather, we need to make sure our buildings can accommodate that. We've also got to be able to provide a healthier environment for people using the buildings. So we are conscious of the environment that we are providing to make sure that there is clean and good quality air within the building and it's well ventilated and meets the needs of the users. To ensure that we don't have um, continued biodiversity loss, there is now government regulations in re requiring us to provide biodiversity and species enhancement when we leave a site, trying to minimise the impact that we have on the flora and fauna that were there before we arrived. Using innovative modern methods of construction, we're also trying to reduce the amount of resources we use and the impact that we have on local environments. So this may involve us doing more manufacturing of um, the building off-site in a more controlled factory environment. There, there are modular construction methods going on and you may have seen in the news or um, on websites about 3D printing being used. So um, they can now build buildings using the 3D printing technology, like with using concrete. Next slide, please, Jamie. This is a nice little cartoon. So you can see there's a, a very skeptic in the audience there saying, but what if all this is a big hoax, this climate change thing? What if we're, you know, just it's, it's all a lie? Well, actually, if that is the thought, you can see from the presenter slide that actually there is a lot of benefits. We will have energy independence through the use of renewable energies. We'll be preserving the rainforests and based on this um, presentation, we'll be able to demonstrate to you the, the, gener the creation of green jobs. Next slide, please, Jamie. Thank you, Richard. OK, thanks, Alison. Thanks, Alison. So, so why are there environmental and sustainability roles in construction? And I think Alison's actually just done a really good job of, of highlighting why there are roles in sustainability and environmental um, 
positions in construction. It's really crucial. Um, the built environment has got a really big impact on our wider environment uh, and on the globe. Um, and just kind of to repeat and reiterate some of Alison's comments, in, in the UK, the built environment sector accounts for 25% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. So that's carbon, that's methane, um, refrigerant gas and things like that. And it's 60% of the UK's material use. So that's all of the, I guess, um, concrete and steel that comes out of the ground, or should I say stone and aggregate to create concrete. Um, but it's also 60% of the waste generation. So we've got a huge amount of material consumption and then a huge amount of um, material waste that we throw away. And, and, and we need to work and work really hard on trying to reduce that, making it um, kind of sourcing more renewable sort of materials, but also finding ways of reducing our waste and keeping materials for as long as we possibly can, either in buildings or once they're taken out of buildings, reusing them somewhere else. Um, next slide, please, Jamie. So there's there's all sorts of, um, I guess, compliance regulations and legislation now around um, sustainability. And really this has come because governments have realised that we need a safe and healthy environment in which to live and that we need to live sustainably. Um, by having laws and regulations, it kind of makes or it almost forces um, people, companies, organisations to follow processes uh, and, and adhere to those processes and requirements when working um, on, on a project, particularly in construction. Um, but it's not just laws. Um, our clients are the people who pay for our services, i.e. for buildings to be built, and their stakeholders, so the people who invest in, 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 in buildings and clients, often have expectations and requirements when it comes to the environment and sustainability too. So sustainability and the environment, a bit like social value, is becoming a big reputa reputational item for companies. We've got to be doing the right thing in order to get repeat business. So it's my and Alison's job, um, or an environmental or a sustainability manager's job, to ensure that the laws, the regulations and the client requirements are always followed and met. Um, but actually, it's not just about bare bones compliance. And we um, are kind of, again, to repeat on what Alison has said before, we've got to work to ensure that what we're building, what we're doing is really improving the area that we're building it in. Um, so that could be putting in measures to improve air quality by planting um, more trees, removing fossil fuel burning equipment. It could be things, um, really innovative things like um, installing paints, which suck up air particles and, and, and things like that from um, busy traffic and roads. It could be improving the energy efficiency of our buildings to reduce the, the energy demand and the carbon associated with that. And it can be things like encouraging sustainable transport. So perhaps better connecting pedestrian routes or cycle routes, um, installing the infrastructure needed for um, electric cars um, or for safe cycle storage. Um, next slide, please, Jamie. And if you can just click, just click, click, bring it all up. So there are all sorts of regulation that control um, how buildings can or should be built and how we as organisations and companies need to interact with the environment. Um, there are numerous regulations that require us to protect and prevent harm to the environment. And I won't go through them all, but um, there are items around tree protections, items that we have to follow through planning. Most local authorities now have something called a, a local plan, which sets out a whole host of requirements across, across the building sector. There is always one on sustainability. And that kind of sets the, the, the local um, areas requirements. So Manchester City Council have got a very good one. Um, London also has a really good one. They kind of these big cities are almost leading the field in those areas. Uh, and then we've got the legislation around the water that we consume, whether we can extract it or discharge it. Um, protection measures on ecology. Um, so lots of species in the UK are protected all the way down to to wild birds, even pigeons. You know, you can't hurt pigeons on, on site. So it's really important that when we're on a site, we're considering everything on it and around it and making sure that we're acting accordingly to protect that. Great, next slide please, Jamie. That me. So how do the subjects that you're currently studying at school or college link to environmental and sustainability careers? And I think hopefully this next section will show you 
that actually nearly everything that you do at school will link into something in relation to environment or sustainability. Next slide, please, Jamie. So subjects that may be of use to you if you wish to pursue an environmental career um, may include all the sciences. So if you're looking at chemistry, biology or physics, then they are all relevant to what Richard and I do on a daily basis. So some of the work that we do before we start in site involves us looking at chemistry, chemical reports. So we often get the soil tested, one to help us understand is there any contamination in it, but also to understand how it's made up and how we can work on it in terms of what kind of foundations are we going to need. Biology, so as we've talked about quite a bit, there is a lot of work that goes on in terms of us looking at the animals and plants, so the flora and fauna that are on the site. So it's important that we understand how all these natural systems work and how they all link together. In terms of physics, um, as we've touched on, it's really important that we make sure our buildings are future climate ready. So we have to understand the, the physics associated with that, how, how much air is going to come in in terms of ventilation, fresh air in, um, waste air out, um, the building physics about how it's going to be built, looking at the building structure, so um, architecture and things like that, all require physics. Then if you go on to geography, again, understanding land use, uh, natural, disaster, natural disasters, weather systems, but also then the human side of it, the human geography, looking at the social aspects. So as Richard touched on earlier in relation to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, it's really important that we not only tackle the local environment, but we look at poverty, um, making sure everybody has access to clean water, all that, that, all that good stuff that you cover in human geography is all relevant to what, what we do. In terms of English, um, a lot of the work we do also requires us to write reports. We we have to make business cases to our directors to say, you know, this is what we as a business want to do in order to ensure that we are a sustainable organisation. Richard and I will also write reports to our customers or our clients, the people that we are, are building the projects for. They want an update on what we are doing and how we are um, impacting the, the local environment and what we're doing to improve it. So it's important that we can write good reports, but that we can also then present those reports to, to our customers. In relation to maths, as you may have picked up today, there are a lot of statistics and a lot of data that goes on in relation to the environment. So often we are collating data on the amount of waste we've produced, the amount of carbon produced, but also the amount of carbon saved. So it's important that we can look at all that data, manage it, manipulate it and present it back. Art Design DT. So again, coming back to that bit of how we are designing the buildings, the systems and the operating um, systems that are going to go into that building to make it work, um, how we present that, that data, they're all related to the sort of the art design and DT side of the, the subjects that you're studying and, and tie back into this. Um, and finally, at the bottom, we've got IT and computing. So not only do we have to be able to to use IT and computing in terms of that report writing and presentation side that I previously talked about, but also a lot of software is used um, in helping us understand the environmental impact or the carbon impact of a building. So software is used to help Richard and I determine the, the carbon footprint of our project, both in terms of its construction, but then in its operation when, when that the client takes on and starts using it. So all those subjects, can we can tie them into an environmental career. Other, other subjects that also may be useful would include sociology and psychology. So again, relating back to some of those um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals about looking at the bigger picture. Next slide, please, Jamie. But it's not just about um, the, the academic and the knowledge side, it's also about the skills that you possess. So if you've got skills like problem solving, then that's really useful for an environmental career. Often um, Richard and I will be called to a project if something's gone wrong and it's up to us to um, understand what's gone wrong and how can we solve to make it better. Or even before, before a project starts, we're presented with a, a, a problem and we want to make sure we get a sustainable solution, we'll be involved in, in solving that. 
But also, if you've just got a natural passion that you want to make a difference to the environment, then um, an environmental career, a sustainability career within construction industry could could be something that would appeal to you because you really can make a difference. I feel, and I'm sure Richard feels the same, that we make a difference on a daily basis working on the projects and the buildings that we do. We've got that opportunity to really have an impact. A really, really important skill for us is about building relationships and working with different people. Um, one of the most challenging parts of the job, I think, um, is about influencing people and, and, and getting people to do what what one what the right thing is to do but also what you want them to do um, and that can that can be a real challenge in some of the sustainability conversations that, that we have um, but it's really rewarding in terms of the variety of people that we get to work with going from the regulators that Richard talked about to the people within our organisation to the clients and the people that we are, um, are building the building for but also the local communities that we are working in so there's a real opportunity to interact and communicate and develop relationships with a wide range of people um, and, and that's a really good part of the job. You need to have really good communication skills because as I say you can one day you're talking to the managing director of your region or, or another organisation, you're talking to uh, one of your clients and then you could be talking to, to, to school children like you, do you know? So there's a, a, a range of different people that you have to, to relate to and you have to be able to, to communicate your message clearly and concisely. Um, the, the final part of, of the job is also you get to be outdoors a lot and, it, and it's nice. You're not stuck behind a desk nine to five. We do get that opportunity to go out on site um, and, and make a difference in, in the natural environment. So being outdoors is, is a good part of, of the role. I certainly enjoy that part. Next slide, please, Jimmy. So roles in construction. So whilst um, We've talked about all the different skill sets and subjects that you need to have. There are a number of different roles um, inside the construction sector relating to environment and sustainability. And Richard and I are going to talk you through a few of these um, this morning. There may well be roles that haven't been thought about yet that are going to be future future environmental sustainability roles within in the construction industry. You know, and the I think that's really fascinating that actually you've got an opportunity to shape some of those future roles that we aren't even aware of yet. Next slide, please, Jamie. So the first role I'm going to talk about is an ecologist, and here's your first opportunity to, to get involved and interact. On the slide, you can see there are pictures of a number of different animals. Can you please use the chat function and tell Jamie the answers to what the names of these animals are. He, he doesn't know, so we've got to tell him. So there are nine, eight animals there. Let's see how many of those eight that we can that we can work out between us all. I'm going to keep talking to give you a chance to answer some of the questions, to answer, make answers to that. Um, so the animals on this slide are all protected species, and these are all animals that are protected at European level. So at European level, these animals are all considered at risk in terms of their um, of becoming extinct um, and, and we've got to make sure that when we start on a site we do not do anything to, to cause harm uh, to these animals. If you can just go on to the next slide Jamie and then we'll come back to that one in a minute. So as an ecologist your the role of an ecologist is to, make, to undertake site visits, undertake studies and surveys of the animals and the plants and the environment to ensure that accurate data is available about how our construction project is going to have an impact on it. Um, you will be advising, as an, as an ecologist, you would advise like Wilmot Dixon or ISG on the legal regulations associated with those animals and the steps that we'd have to take place on site to make sure no harm comes of them. An ecologist will produce reports for us before we start on site, letting us know the quantity of animals that are there, the types of different species and any specific measures that we have to undertake. They will also help us advise our clients or other local stakeholders, local people who have an interest in the site and the ecology on that site of what needs to do. And they will often come back to the site during the construction phase and make sure we're doing what we said we were going to do. 
Now there are two pictures on the screen just now. The one on the left, that long windy fence is a newt fence. So great crested newts are one of the protected species and newts have sticky feet so they can climb up fences and that's why there's a lip on that fence to, to stop the newts getting up and over and it keeps them out and keeps them safe. On the right hand side, it looks like there it, it looks like a telephone mast, but it's not. It's actually one of the, the poshest bat houses you, you may well see. So uh, to give you an indication, that bat house cost £15,000 and it's solar powered. It's got a nice little uh, humidity controlled, temperature controlled box. So when the bats move in, they're kept at the right temperature, nice and warm and safe. Can we go back a slide, please, Jamie, and we'll see. And can you let me know how we got on in terms of the, the number of suggestions for what animals were on the screen, if any? I've not had any suggestions yet. OK, uh, I think I can name a few, but oh, do you uh, want to have a go then? <laughs> OK, well, ob well, obviously we've got a badger. Yeah, but badger's uh, top middle. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, it, well, is that a, that's not a newt, is it? on the, the left in the middle? Yes, it is. That's a great crested newt. So that's that little creature I was talking about with the sticky feet who can climb fences. Um, so we've got nesting birds top left. So I'm, I'm sure you knew what the, the birds were, Jamie. So well, um, I mean, I knew they were birds, so I couldn't tell yeah, you what yeah, they were. <laughs> <birds>. <laughs> and then beside, so on that top row, we've got birds and badgers. And then at the, the top right, we've got bats. And they're nice snuggled into their box there. And then in the middle, we've got the newts. We've got a water vole in the middle, if anybody remembers wind in the willows. Uh, butterflies, so look at the insects and invertebrates. And then on the bottom, we've got dormice and then another picture of a newt. So well done, Jamie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> we you move that. on then. So Richard and I have said this many times. There's also a requirement on us um, soon to be a legal requirement and at the moment a best practice requirement to to make sure that we leave the the habitat in, in a better place than than when we arrived and um, the, the picture here shows a green roof and that's one of the the things that many um of the principal contractors are looking at providing providing habitats on on the roofs of the buildings that we're putting in place so um the the enhancements may be like that really posh that house that I showed you a minute ago, um, making sure that if we if we take down trees or buildings where bats have have roosted, that we provide alternative accommodation for them. Um, we also have to do the the same for for nesting birds. So, um, as as a construction company, we would try not to take any trees down during the bird nesting season. Um, if if we cause any harm or disturbance to a protected species, we as a company could be found five thousand pounds an animal. So if you've got a hundred bats in a roost, that's a lot of money, and certainly more than um, Richard and I earn in a year. So um, it's it's really important that that we do the right thing and and we make sure we replace and enhance the habitats that we have damaged or or um, impacted during our construction. Next slide, please, Jamie. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot today about protecting our environment and as an environmental advisor or environmental manager, similar to, to, to my role, it's really in, important that we ensure our projects comply with the laws and regulations um, that address issues such as air quality or land and water contamination, um, waste management, just generally making sure that we reduce um, or eliminate the environmental risk associated with a project. So as well as making sure we've got that legal compliance, we also have, have a job of working with our project teams, working with our clients, working with the local communities um, and, and the wider environmental teams within our organisations um, to ensure that happens. We will often conduct field surveys, so we'll go out to a site and before a project starts, um, have, a, have a look around, get an understanding of, of the lie of the land and, and if, is there any other environmental risks that haven't been identified. Um, we'll have a look at the site history. So, you know, it, it might be a, a greenfield site and it's, it's only ever had sheep grazing on it. But um, 
on the other hand, it might be in the middle of a city centre and it used to have have a petrol station on it. So, so it's understanding that site history and, and therefore the potential risks um, associated with it. And then also then we'll make sure that anything that we we plan to do, making sure that that happens and, and that we've left the site in as, as good a condition as possible. So again, looking at looking at the pictures, you, you can see, you know, we're, we're all working there together, uh, working there together as a team, um, looking at the project, looking at the plans and, and making sure everybody understands what's required, looking, looking ahead in terms of the next stages of works. Um, and, and what you wouldn't want to go on to site is find a dirty old oil a fuel tank like there is there on, on the top right. So that's an, another another role within construction. Next slide, please, Jamie. And this is definitely not what we want to do when we turn up on site. We don't want Mrs Smith standing beside her washing line complaining about the big dirty truck driving past, all that dust being kicked up, um, the man cutting the bricks and he's sending dust and smoke and everything all over her over her washing. So again, we, we've just we've got a real responsibility to make sure we don't cause nuisance in the communities in, in which we're working. That's really important to us because we don't want complaints. Next slide, please, Jamie. Um, Finally, there's also sort of archaeology and heritage. So even as an environmental manager or as, a, as an environmental advisor, it's really important that we make sure we understand um, if there is a risk of archaeological finds on site. Um, we would, similar to getting an ecologist on site to look at plants and animals, we would get an archaeologist to come to site and carry out investigations to make sure there isn't no risk of um, archaeological finds or if there is that we've got plans in place um, or we've got an archaeologist on call to watch and supervise the works that are taking place on site again because we don't want to destroy or damage any of that heritage within the local area. The examples are on the screen are, are from one of our one of our sites where um, religious artifacts were found on site and had to be preserved and removed from site before the construction project can commence. Next slide, please, Jamie. This year now, Richard. Yeah, cheers. So um, landscape manager. Um, so as a landscape manager, you'd be responsible for protecting green spaces and the life within them. And your duties might include conducting wildlife surveys, um, producing reports for clients and businesses, detailing your observations and sustainability recommendations. You could be overseeing natural conservation areas, historic gardens, woodlands, parks, roadside verges or housing estates. So it's a really broad kind of uh, area that you might be working in. And you'd probably work alongside ecologists. Um, they kind of support you with that more technical information and then you'd be feeding it in towards perhaps a landscape architect or the project team. So the role of the landscape manager involves kind of the following um, duties, assessing landscapes and their ecosystems, surveying sites to identify existing natural resources and plant and animal life, advising on the impact of proposed changes to land use, meeting communities and involving others in managing public spaces. And that's really important, the whole community engagement. I think it goes back to um, Alison was saying previously around communi communication skills, I think when you work in the built environment, you've you've got to you've got to work really hard at engaging with and talking to the people who are around your site. It's really important. You're going in, you're disturbing a, a, an area. You need to get everybody on board and and I, I guess share the positive um, the positives from the project. What you're doing to improve that space, but also allaying any kind of concerns that they might have. Um, you'd be involved in producing plans and reports on landscape preservation. Um, devising management and maintenance plans to ensure that spaces are preserved for future use and enjoyment. So that's really important as well. It's not just about what we're building and delivering over a year or, or a couple of years. It's that what we, we have delivered can then be maintained and, and managed for the next 5, 10, 25 years um, so that the, it's, it's got a, a positive legacy. Um, supervising construction projects um, carried out by landscape architects. So landscape architecture is, is a very different role to kind of landscape manager. They're all about designing what's going into your external space, whether that's your hard landscaping or what we would call soft landscaping, which is all the grass and plants and, and ponds and, and whatever that go, goes on there. That's all based on the advice that you get from the landscape manager and your ecologist. 
uh, and then advising on planning applications and public inquiries. So also really important. It's about telling the local authority about what you're going to do, telling the local community about what you're going to do in order to get a final approval. Uh, and we've got some great kind of images of, of the different landscapes that could be produced down on the bottom there. If you could hit the next slide, please, Jamie. So then we've got um, design managers, design manager architects, two kind of um, quite different roles, but quite interlinked. So design managers coordinate all of the design work required during construction projects. They're a really central part, particularly in, in main building contractor teams. They manage the production of technical drawings and plans used to build a structure or, or building. Um, they bring together the architects, the structural engineers, the service engineers, all of the specialist designers, the, the BIM technicians, so building information management, um, to create and coordinate a design um, which is successful and can ultimately be built. Um, if you've got a passion for design or for IT, uh, as well as the environment, then perhaps a, a role in designing sustainable um, buildings is, is for you. And it's a great one. Design managers that we have on site now that are engaged with sustainability, uh, it's, it's the best possible kind of outcome because you design sustainability into a building early, um, you're going you're gonna to have a sustainable building and you're going to achieve um, success. And then we've just got kind of down here some, some images of of previous um, buildings that have, have kind of performed quite a high sustainability standard. I think the one at the bottom is, is Two Rivers and that's a passive house school. And passive house projects is, is kind of, there are lots of different sustainability assessments that you can now apply to buildings. So passive house is one, Briam is another. Um, I won't go into the into details, but if you've got questions on it, then you can um, whack them into the chat. But passive house is all around kind of the build building fabric and the efficiency of that fabric um, and improving your energy performance really to get as, as 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 low. So you need the smallest amount of energy possible to run the building and then that, that in turn obviously drives down your, your carbon. If you can hit slides, the next slide for me, please, Jenny. And then so architects. So architects create the designs for construction projects. They um, have specialist construction knowledge and, and a really high level um, drawing skills in order to design buildings that are functional, safe, sustainable and ultimately get to look at. Um, they're often responsible for the design and, and the placing or, or the orientation of the building. And that's really important when you start to talk about um, delivering sustainable buildings. They design how the building will look, its different component parts, the sorts of materials that might be used, uh, and alongside MEP engineers design how the building will function. So that might have uh, like a mechanical ventilation system, it might be naturally ventilated. They're going to choose the sorts of materials that are going into the building and, and, and that in turn has a big impact on sustainability because it's all about where your resources are coming from. Are they coming from sustainable forests, which they should be in the UK? Are they coming from um, responsibly sourced quarries and, and things like that. So if you've got an interest in design and creativity in drawing, I would say in English because architects are great storytellers uh, and in maths because you need that kind of um, skill set to come up with some of these um, structures and performance values, then an architect might be of interest for you. Uh, next slide, please, Jamie. So next steps after school, I mean, where can you go and um, what can you do on your journey to working in an environmental or sustainability field in construction? And if you hit the next slide for me again, please, Jenny. So there are kind of a lot of steps and I think routes which you can which can lead into environmental roles in construction. I don't necessarily think there is a, a right or, or wrong. The, the, the beauty of it is that there are so many now. But you could look at the A levels you want to take and Alison's kind of done a great job at highlighting some of those subjects that are relevant to um, sustainability and construction. You've got T level, so those more kind of practical skills, if that's that's more your bag. Um, college courses, there are university courses, um, apprenticeships, so it's really great to get experience out on site, out with companies um, to kind of prepare you on, on your road to whatever career it is that you, you want to take. And I think apprenticeships and work experience are two kind of good examples because that's very going to give you very quickly a flavour of the sorts of organisations, the sorts of companies that maybe you want to work for and the fields that you want to work in um, later down the line. Um, there are construction trainee schemes. Um, so there's kind of a real range of stuff that you can look for. 
I would just make sure that you speak to your careers advisor as they're going to be well placed to discuss your options. And you can always reach out to, to organisations and, and companies. I think they're often um, very keen to tell you about what you could maybe do or, or give you some insight. And just to kind of reiterate that there isn't a set route um, which is best to follow. You can take many different routes to an environmental career in construction. And if you hit the next slide for me, Jamie. And so lastly, if you want to get some more information, um, there's a great website here called Go Construct. So they've got lots of info on careers in construction, sustainability careers. And I think as well, you can probably look up the CITB, which is more of a construction industry training board, but they're um, very keen about attracting new talent, uh, men and women in, into construction. Um, so take a look, do a little bit of research and, and I guess start to inform you, your own opinions. And next slide, Jamie. And I think that's everything from us, just, um, just Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, to Richard and Alison for their talk. Lots and lots of uh, information in there. Um, teachers, uh, I'm just going to drop this in the chat now. Please do let us know what you think of today's talk uh, by filling in our quick feedback form. Uh, link to that in the chat. Uh, but now we do have a 10 minutes for some questions. So if you do have any questions for Richard and Alison, please do pop them in the chat and I will read them out for you. Uh, whilst we are waiting for that, though, um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I've got a few notes that I'd, I'd like to pick up on. Um, you, you started off the talk highlighting kind of the, the importance of why we need to think about sustainability in the environment in terms of construction. And you obviously talked about the, the climate crisis. Um, it, it can be quite a source of anxiety for a lot of people, especially in the younger generation. And some people can believe that the climate crisis is is too big and that um, it, it's kind of too big to comprehend and, and too big to, to do anything about. Uh, and I wonder if, if you might touch upon that in terms of your role. I don't know who wants to go first on this one, if, if either of you have any any thoughts. I mean, it's, it's a really good point. I think it, it is difficult and sometimes it can feel very overwhelming. I don't think just um, not necessarily just the younger generation. Sometimes I sit in my office and I'm like, oh my goodness, how am I going to get up this mountain? Uh, I think it's that old adage, adage of, um, was it think local at global? It, you've just got to chip, chip away at it. The science shows that we can make, um, you know, we can make a change. We can stop the rise in temperature and, and things like that. It's it's all about behaviour, and it's a it's about behaviour in your personal lives, but it's it's about behaviour in in our in our industry and in our jobs. I think just every, every little helps. The great thing is is that we know well. It's not great, but we know that construction is a big contributor, and we know that the construction industry is trying to to react to uh, reduce and mitigate the impacts that it's had in, you know, in the past, but, but currently on, on projects that it's working on. Um, and I think that is a good news story. The more I work on projects, so even in the last sort of seven, eight years, that response has been has been huge and it's drastically changed the way that um, our industries are working. Now on every project we think about sustainability and, and we've got different um, activities and functions in place and there's a greater educational kind of, I guess, movement alongside that. I think Richard's absolutely right, Jamie. It's a, the my director's old adage is, "How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time?" And it's that same bit. You can you can only do what you're in control of. So every little helps. So if you walk to school instead of getting a lift to school, for example, if you if you get the train to school instead of getting a lift to school, just do those little things that you're in control of and that you can do. Then know that if everybody does all those little things, those little things add up and make a big difference. Absolutely fantastic. And have you uh, have you both always been interested in uh, in the environment and in sustainability or is it a role that you kind of fell into? And I'm going to ask that to Alison first, please. Um, I, I fell into it, I think, because up until um, so you may have guessed I, I did my education in Scotland um, up up until three weeks before I started university, I was going to be a primary school teacher and I saw an advert in the, the newspaper for a course in environmental science and I changed my mind completely and that was me off, off to university to do environmental science. So um, it's certainly like Richard said, it, it wasn't something that necessarily planned for and, and there are many ways ways to, to get to where you are. Um, so no, I didn't plan for it, but I'm 
really glad that it, it landed in front of me and, and I've gone on to do what I've what I've done. What I would also say though is one of my colleagues who's now an environmental manager started out in the construction industry as a bid writer and he showed an interest in environment and through his ongoing learning and development he has you know picked up the skills taught himself and has, has now progressed to be an environmental manager so it, it uh, you know sort of go back to what church said there is no right way to get into this you you know you can pick it up if you've got that interest and you've got the right skill set then then it's certainly something that you can you can do yeah I've, and i've definitely noticed that as well it seems very interchangeable the sustainability sits in so many different roles now as long as you've got an interest you can step from one discipline to another um, and you'll learn on the job i think but, but the great thing is, is that whatever you're doing previously, you'll bring those skills into into the sustainability sector and share it. And I think that's really important. I, I think for me, uh, I had a I really enjoyed geography at school. Uh, didn't really want to do geography at university and decided to do environmental science and just kind of fell in love with it. Never thought I'd end up working in construction. I honestly thought it'd be conservation, probably in like Costa Rica or the Bahamas. I'd be surfing, looking after turtles, and instead I'm I'm looking after concrete. But it's been it's been fascinating, and I, I wouldn't uh, I don't think I'd change it. It's um there's so much going in on in the construction sector around sustainability, um, what you can do, what you can get involved in. Um, it's great. That's a really good point, I think. Um, yes, I, th I, I think th there is a, uh, a an idea, there's an image about what a job in construction is, and it's uh, a lot of people imagine it's bricklaying. And when people imagine jobs in uh, environmental and sustainability, they imagine, as you describe things like looking after turtles and, and washing oil off of ducks and things like that. Um, but actually, uh, the reality is, as you say, there's all sorts of uh, jobs in, in every sector in environment and sustainability now because it's just getting more and more important. People are realising that it's it's a part of every facet of our lives. So, um, so Richard, you're looking after newts rather than, than so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so both of you did environmental science at university, but as you touched upon at the end, there are lots and lots of different routes these days. Uh, people don't have to go to university to do environmental science to uh, do these roles. So I was just wondering if you could just touch on that a little bit again. I know you, you, you talked about it in the in the talk, but um, just so, so as as Richard um, said, one of one of the routes into certainly um, construction, but I'm sure many other sectors as well is we, we, we've got management trainee schemes. So we've we take on um, young people at, at 16, we take on young people at 18 um, and, and we put them through a, a trainee programme so they can work across a number of different sectors and, and I've currently got um, a young lady working from me who um, thought she wanted to be a, a, a construction site manager, a build manager, but actually through her involvement in environment, she's now changed and she's now an environmental management trainee. So she has she has no um, environmental qualifications whatsoever or science qualifications. She started out on one route and, and realised it and is now on a, a managed programme, um, picking up the skills and the education that she needs to become an environmental manager. Um, so I, I would say, you know, I go back to the point that we keep reiterating, there, there is no right route to get into it. There's a number of different options. Um, there are environmental apprenticeships. There's the, the trainee programmes. I can't think of anything else, Richard, but I'm sure there must be others. There's, there's loads. And I think what's great with construction is that there's a there's a real depth. You can some people love being on a construction site and working in site, site offices and, and doing that. And you often get people who are, uh, I guess, they're more practically minded. They want to do those skills out on site. Um, and, and so you find those on, on your kind of construction site locations. But just because you're doing that doesn't mean you can't be involved in sustainability. People come with ideas. Um, often the best ideas come from the, 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 the men and women on site doing um, just their normal day jobs because they've identified that they can save waste in some way or, or make a, a cost saving. We get a lot of the apprentices, um, a lot of work experience, um, I guess, uh, people who come on site and then get employed. Uh, and they might become on-site sustainability or environment or biodiversity champions. So increasingly there are these kind of roles um, where you're looking after kind of a, a set aspect of, of something on site. So that might be monitoring the utilities, it might be looking at um, 
the sorts of species that are coming onto site, what we're doing to protect it, just kind of checking over and then feeding into the project manager. Then you've got roles in like um, in, the, in the, the, the big offices or, the, or the, the main offices where it might be a little bit more technical, you might or it might be um, like an advisor role like mine or, or Alison's where you've, you're looking after a number of projects and you're engaging with the project teams and saying, oh, you should maybe, maybe thinking about about these sorts of aspects of sustainability or these compliance requirements. Um, so yeah, it, it does vary. You don't need to have a degree to work in, in construction in the environment or sustainability sector in construction. You just need to have an interest, I think. Uh, you know, different different um, different forms of education open different doors, but it doesn't mean that. Um, I don't think a degree is the be all and end all. You can have good A levels, you can go to college, you can get college qualifications, or T levels. They'll all open a, a route. And if you're good at it and you're passionate about it, it doesn't matter what you've got. You'll get to and um, you'll get to where you want to go. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. And we are out of time now. So um, Alison and Richard, thank you so much for speaking uh, uh, for us today. Um, don't know if you want to just say last few sentences. Anything? No, just just thank you very much. And as, as Richard said at the start, if you have any questions or we can be of any further assistance, please get in touch through through yourself, Jimmy, and we're happy to help. Yeah. And good luck. Good luck for the future. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you ever so much. OK, uh, don't forget, uh, you can find out lots more about careers and options on the GMAX website. That's G-M-A-C-S dot co dot UK. Um, uh, teachers, please do let us know what you thought about the session uh, on the feedback form that I've dropped in the chat. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Uh, thank you and goodbye for now. <laughs>